Welcome back, everyone, to Design Thunder Energy. Looking for Kevin Horde here. Lorenzo Fon sitting over here. What up, buddy? Hello, man. Just rolling along. You guys still socially isolating over there? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Situation changes day by day, but, you know, some retail, like some non essential retail, is starting to open, but I don't quite understand the need for that as of right now. Like, so by that, so uh, again, just because the situation is changing so darn much, mm -hmm. um, we are recording this on May 18th, 2020. Yep. And what I mean by like non-essential retail is like bookstores or like clothing stores in the mall are opening hmm. up, but they're still curbside only. So, so are they kind of doing what restaurants did before or it's just like curbside pickup? Yes. But, but people what, aren't actually inside the brick and mortar stores? Yeah, so nobody can still like nobody can wander the malls or anything. But what I don't understand is that you know, who is placing an order to Nordstrom's to go pick up clothing? I mean, uh, I don't know. Like why couldn't you just order it online and have it sent to you, right? Like is that's a sort of a weird delineation where like food I get you know, just because of the nature of food, <laughs> you know, and groceries, but maybe availability. Books. Who knows? <sighs> maybe. You know, maybe people are trying to support those local businesses, local retailers. Perhaps, yeah. That that is a good point for like the local local bookstores and stuff like that. You know, as opposed to just buying everything on on Amazon. Right. Right. So there's that. It's it's still a, an interesting delineation, but I'm I'm keeping an eye as as uh, longtime listeners of this podcast will know. Uh, I'm a huge uh, theme park nerd, and this is not to say that I would feel comfortable going back to Disneyland should it open this week or anything. Right. But Shanghai Disneyland did open uh, last week Monday. I was gonna say I was wondering if you were monitoring that. Yeah, I've been keeping an eye on it. Uh, what's like, this is a very side tangent thing, but we'll try and do a quick version of this just because it's of interest to me. Um, they're they're capped at I believe thirty percent capacity, which is somewhere around like the twenty four thousand guests range, which is a big deal to know because park capacity are not numbers that are usually made officially public. So the fact that we have like a hard number mm -hmm. at what you know, 30% is, is a kind of a big deal. Um, that said, you have to make uh, reserved tickets ahead of time. You can't just show up. So like annual pass holders also have to make uh, timed reservations to show up. Hmm. Uh, within the announcement that Shanghai Disneyland would be opening back up, the first week sold out. So that shows that there is a demand for the parks themselves. Right. Uh, and then since then, both Universal Orlando's City Walk and the Disney Springs District in Orlando for Walt Disney World, uh, those are not theme parks. Those would be basically the, the attached tourist malls right. to the theme parks. Uh, those have opened up in a phased fashion. So like the restaurants and certain retail maybe, but for sure the third-party restaurants have opened at both uh, Orlando City Walk and uh, Disney Springs in Florida. And from the videos I've seen there, there is not interest for that per se. So, like, people were taking video of the quote-unquote crowd showing up, and it'd be, like, two people, <laughs> like, walking down the pathway. Well, you have said in the past, right, that there are uh, fewer local Disneyites in the Orlando area uh, than there are in your area, correct? Correct. Like it's Orlando is more of a touristy Yes. So Orlando is more of a tourist destination, so I don't I don't foresee uh, people flying to Orlando just for Disney Springs or Universal City Walk. Uh, right. I think the the big thing we'll to to see is what will happen uh, should the parks actually open in Florida, and they likely will be able to open in Florida first. Uh, 
our governor here in California is definitely taking a more cautious approach than the governor of Florida. Um, hence, even our uh, the retail areas here. So, like mm-hmm. the City Walk for Hollywood here and Dis- downtown Disney is what or it's our D- Disney Springs equivalent still has not opened in any capacity at all. So. Uh, yeah. Again, I, that's not to say that I would go day one, but it's just more of a, I'm, just, I'm monitoring the situation just out of personal curiosity, but also like if that does open and that does lead a lot of tourists to come towards my area, then that becomes a concern for me regardless if I'm there or not, right? So. Yep, for sure. Yeah, living in a, a place that's a high tourist destination uh, things like that always become of particular interest you know like it, even throughout the last five years of the various like measles outbreaks that would come to disneyland yep due to non-vaccination know. yeah <laughs> i'll say it choice choices shall we say um so you know those have also been important for me to monitor not that i'm concerned about catching it myself per se i am fully vaccinated but it's still the potential to spread around and all that jazz you know is a public health concern when you live in an area with you know 10 million people in the metro area is uh <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been it's been a fun 10 weeks shall we say here yeah we're heading to this is the start of week 10 for self-isolation here in california so we yeah. um pretty much are opening the doors today oh boy oh now boy. there are supposedly occupancy restrictions and i think it's like under ten thousand square feet you're at like 75 percent occupancy and over ten thousand square feet you're at like 30 percent occupancy or something like that but um parameters what was that? Those are sort of strange parameters. I feel like thirty percent in general everywhere seems yeah. to be a good. Cover. I don't. I think the idea is that you know, like the small mom and pop shops and stuff, um, are allowed to be closer to capacity. And who knows? I don't know. Uh, uh, I know. do not have faith in our governor, but uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Pretty yeah. much, if you ask anybody, everything's open for business. So, life as normal oh again. We will see. Um, my wife and my family and I are pretty much going to keep operating the same way that we have been for for a while. You know, for the past mm-hmm. two months, for at least the next two three weeks, and see how numbers pan out, and we'll go from there. But yeah, man, that yep. is our the... that is our mid may covid-19 update. <laughs> yes. So again by, by the time everybody listens to this the, the news will by the time we stop recording the news will have changed. Yeah, so that's very true. The situation will have changed. That said, let's let's actually steer towards topic here. Um, we will be discussing Star Wars the Clone Wars. We're, we're we're sticking with it. We're back on track here. Yeah. And we're moving on to season 4 episode 20. Uh, an episode called Bounty. Absolutely. This is our 90th Clone Wars episode that we'll be discussing here. Wait, you said uh, 90th? Yeah, this uh, that's what I have. I have it down as 90. Is that Holy what you got? Holy shit. That's what I our got, Our 90th man. story, shall we say. So, you know, that, that said we broke up the movie into... The movie was four parts, right? Yes, four. So, yeah, so... Our, our 90th uh, discussion on, on Clone Wars here. So yeah, man. And this episode aired March twelfth, twenty or sorry, March second, twenty twelve. March second, twenty twelve. Yeah, and I got a production by date. Kyle Dunleavy and written by Katie Lucas. Is that what you got? Yep. Yep. For sure. Production number uh, four twelve. Yeah. Yeah. So, so our uh, our fortune cookie today is yeah. who we are never changes, who we think we are does. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty stumped by this one. I put a. The first thing that jumped out to me was Ahsoka, right? Uh, I can sort. I can see that. Yeah, I'll fly with that. It seemed to make more sense the first time that I read it than when I say it out loud. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. This is one of the 
clunkier fortune cookies to me. You know, I get its sentiment. It's just a oddly worded sentence, shall we say? It's not, it's not a smooth fortune cookie that rolls off the tongue. Yeah, I definitely read it a couple of times. You know, as I was, and I write it in my notes every time too. And I was just like, oh, this is this is a clunky one. We'll go with the soak. I don't know if I believe it anymore, but I I did believe it when I wrote it down. Um, so I don't, I don't know what that is. Tells it maybe you. may ooh? How about this? Shmi? Sure. Done this deal. Sounds like so- this sounds like something she would say to to Anakin. Shmi Skywalker. Yeah. Yeah, that's I I could see that that <laughs> getting passed down to him. You know. Yeah. But For does sure. that does that mean uh, he once a slave always a slave? Like, <laughs> mm, that just complicates <laughs> it. I mean, the more you think about it, the more complicated this thing becomes. Because uh, I don't believe it, and I don't think it makes sense either. I agree. That that's where I was stumped with this one. I I don't believe the first part because then this. Uh, it's like I, maybe it should say who we are changes, who we think we are doesn't change. I don't like I no. feel like that would make more sense. Well, cuz like here here's what I get what it's trying to say. I get that it's trying to like sell the idea that self is a perception. That's what I'm getting out of this fortune cookie, right? But then the first part of this, the part before the comma still just I wish it was worded in such a non-definitive, absolute way. Like, that's my problem with it, is that the mm. first part, who we are, never changes. Like, wait, what? <laughs> like, that, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like the idea that they're, because the second part is then, like, it's the perception of who we are that changes. But then, doesn't that therefore change the first part? Like, hey, like, I've realized I'm an asshole and I'm going to make amends to change that. Does that then not change who you are? I don't. No, it means you're an asshole. You just don't think you're an asshole anymore. Just. (laughs) So all the Karens of the world are fucked. Yeah. So this means that Anakin was just a a child murderous uh, cyborg all of the all time, the time. He right? was always forever that. and always he was always that bad yeah right even when he was it a little is. kid so like when he was a little kid he wasn't actually who he really was because who he really was uh it's going to be the darth uh dark yeah. sith lord overruler yep i mean yeah, man. point proven man <laughs> told to him by shmi that's yeah. that's i think that's all there is to it let's move on from that one <laughs> yeah uh, uh, what you got in the newsreel here? So we have uh, just basically a, a recap of what's been going on with Ventress, and it ends with mm-hmm. uh, essentially Ventress being exiled, um, re- really from Dooku, from the Sith, from the Night Sisters, because the Night Sisters are no more. Uh, it's yep. essentially her mother Talzin, and so we pick up, I guess, where we left off last episode and that was mother talzin saying uh your path does not lie with the night sisters you have your own future like go find mm-hmm. it and do your deal and uh so we land first thing she does <laughs> what's that and then the first thing she does is yeah i think you're starting to say it <laughs> where she land on a desert planet which is tatooine right yes definitely it's it's weird because it looks like Tatooine. It definitely feels like Tatooine. It's not any part of Tatooine that we've seen to have specifically seen before. It's like somewhere else on the planet. Okay, because I was going to say, she like she goes into a cantina that is just a complete knockoff of the cantina. Like, my right. question, my next question was, is this the cantina? No, I, I have no evidence that this is most icely. Because by by official standards, the the or you know semi official standards, the the Wikipedia just simply says a seedy spaceport tavern on Tatooine. It does not specify any more than that. So no nothing 
about Mos Eisley, nothing about that cantina. So, and they don't even use the word, by the fact that they're using the word tavern, I don't know what the differentiation really would be there. Right. Or have I really thought about the differentiation between cantina and tavern in real life, honestly speaking? Uh, language, I think, is would be what it is. I mean, Just cantina like, means bar in Spanish, right? Yeah. I, um, however, if you do click on that CD Spaceport Tavern link, it mm-hmm. takes you to the Wikipedia page for Chalman's Spaceport Cantina, also known simply as Chalman's Cantina or as the Mos Eisley Cantina. Ew, okay. Well, that said, the animation and the geography of the part she's walking through Mm -hmm. isn't right like unless there's been like some major i mean look sure maybe there's been some major developments over the next like 20 years right but all the same like because i it tries to mimic a lot of those camera angles and the uh framing down walkways and uh, pathways down most icely right but it, it doesn't match quite right it doesn't feel right and this is even just like it's, it's definitely trying to mimic the look of most icely from the special edition right so like 97 and beyond the the nice like cg up version right um, right but it just something about the animation it just it doesn't feel dusty enough it, and uh, again it's the geography it just doesn't look right i'm going to so, i'm going to look into this a little more and see if i can find any behind the scenes stuff or see if dave Filoni has made like a definitive yes this is most icely or no this is mm-hmm. not right uh scenario yeah. um that way we don't have to beat a dead tauntaun about it um right. i was definitely under the impression that she was at most icely at Chalman's I, Cantina, right? Yeah, I I was definitely uh on the side of just like no, this doesn't look right, so I'm gonna say no. <laughs> That's it. but that was just my personal viewing of it, not and that I had any evidence for or against from the uh, text itself, shall we say? I would say then whatever the intention was, it is misread. Yeah, it got lost on me. That's for sure. Uh. And if it's, you know, if it's not most Eisley, it got lost on me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, yeah. So it's questionable at best. Yeah. Um, For sure. So what he, happens when she gets in there? She takes a couple of shots. She knows the bartender by name. Uh, so she orders something called Prow, which I'm interested in now. I didn't look into that, actually. And I kind of wish I did. But yeah, I don't even know how to spell that. Anyway, it's PR. O W according to the because I watch it with the uh, subtitles on the closed caption, right? So I was curious by that. I I had I had no memory of this drink before, nor had I have I ever heard of this drink referenced again. Um, it clearly wasn't big enough to be re referenced in any of the life possibilities when you go into the cantina in batu they all come up with like very pedestrian names for their drinks shall we say you know right. there's a fuzzy tauntaun and yeah. jet juice yeah <laughs> like jawa juice right don't they sell that but funny enough jawa juice is not available but there is something called java juice weird we had this discussion on i think one of the last preview episodes right talking about galaxy's edge where you kept hearing me say jawa juice and you kept saying jawa juice i was like and at some point i was like no kevin jawa juice and then you were like no it's jawa juice i'm like no i know there's a drink called jawa juice i am telling you they did not go with jawa juice (laughs) for whatever fucking reason so yeah, Clearly, man. I did not learn my lesson. Yeah, you and I are not the main audience for uh, a family theme park, <laughs> as yeah. it were. So, juice of the Java. Yeah. So I. Yeah, I'm still disturbed by that one. So. Uh, yeah. Anyways, Thanks. moving on. Uh, we get kind of a uh, a 
very hard homage slash reference to what we will see happen 20 years later down the line in this exact same cantina. Right. Where a patron is uh, coming on very strong to Ventress, shall we say. And Ventress is definitely doing all she can to buzz him off. And it comes to basically just having to stick a uh, her lightsaber straight through his belly. So when I first saw this, uh, mm-hmm. it looked like she had the the end of the hilt of her lightsaber in his crotch. And I totally thought she just cut his junk off. <laughs> um, but then when it like pans back and you see the lightsaber out through his back, it definitely goes, you know, belly button area, not, not further south. Yeah, she's definitely holding it at like her hip level. Right. That's for sure. Yeah, so she, there, there, yeah, there is like a, a shot of her kind of unclipping it. And then she just kind of rotates it still at that hip level. So, yeah, so I, she she runs this guy through, and then she's got a little quip where she says, I'm not much of a talker. And then everybody in the bar just kind of laughs, and the music starts again. And right. uh, then somebody buys her a drink, and the bartender's like, hey, this is from the lizard in the back. Uh, and it's our buddy Bosk, right? Yep, Bosk, and a new character named Lots Razi. Razi? Razi? Yep. This is uh, some female character who is... Yeah, it's her first appearance on the show. It's her first appearance that we've ever seen of her in general. Yeah. So, yeah, so she's there. She's, like, pinkish purple. She's, like, an in-between Something like there. That. So, basically, what ends up happening is uh, Asajj ended up killing their buddy. So, Bosk and Lots are not really hurt by that they're just like hey we need another person so we're gonna recruit you you're you're just in you don't really have a choice in this matter (laughs) yeah bosk like threatens her he gives her a little bit of a threat where he's like hey you fill in for our guy or we'll turn you into the authorities like right like we don't you know we don't give a shit that he's dead as long as you fill in if you don't then we gotta turn you in I don't know. It's pretty pretty hollow threat, but uh, they leave the bar at this point, and then they go over to meet the quote unquote boss, uh, yeah. who turns out to be Boba Fett, and he's mm-hmm. got a he's got a droid with him, right? Yep, that's gonna be C twenty one High Singer, and we have our other buddy there as well, uh, Dengar. Yeah, yeah, they pronounce it Dengar. I've always heard Dengar. Like then I don't think I've heard it any. I, I I think this would be the only time I've ever heard it aloud, honestly. So, uh, two yeah. s- two side notes. Dengar is voiced by Simon Pegg, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, we do see, um, we do see our old buddy Embo leaving the cantina. Embo is the guy that. with the big the saucer big hat. hat. Yeah, that we saw back in the Seven Samurai episode, and in that uh, that great Obi Wan Rune Heiko, not Rune Heiko, the other guy, Reiko Hardin. Yeah, the box situation. The box situation that we just got through. Yeah, I didn't notice that at all. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yep. He comes out and he whistles at some uh, space dog thing. And mm-hmm. uh, they walk off down the alley, and that's when it kind of pans over to. Then, then Gar, and then they go in and they meet Boba. Um, yeah, yeah. There's something interesting about this task that they've been recruited in. The reason they needed Asajj Ventress is like somebody I forget who exactly, but they mentioned that they needed exactly six people for this mission. Uh, just jumping ahead, I don't know why they need six, but six is the magic number, apparently. Yeah, Lats is the one that's like that that brings that up. We need six yeah. hunters, she says. And without six hunters, we don't have a job. So Bub was yeah. like, all right, whatever. You can come along. He has her name. She says, I don't have one. He's like, oh, it's going to be like that. And then uh, she really just makes like jokes about his stature and whatnot. The entire episode, right. calling him boy and all kinds of shit. But um, I guess she's like, whatever, I'll take the job. And then they all ship off to 
an unnamed place that is apparently an assignment on Corzite. I don't know what that yeah. is. I don't know if that never that's gets a... named throughout the whole episode, as far as I I recall. Yeah, yeah, it's not named in the episode. I guess that would be probably a planet. So this planet has some peculiarities to it, where they land on the t- like on a space station, kind of. Yeah, but it's really um just it's like the Geo-lock docking station. port for yeah. um space elevators that go down through the atmosphere into the Mm. planet itself and uh they're met by mayor ragoso ragoso major ragoso not mayor major ragoso yeah that makes sense uh who explains what their assignment is and it's to take this elevator down uh get on the subway and take care of some cargo to go across town but was like why can't we just fly it there and uh, apparently the atmosphere is under pressure, right? It's like high pressure that would crush any ship that tries to land. Yeah, Just Major th- Ragoso basically gets the full Basil Expedition role here where he is just explaining things nonstop. So he explains the mission, he explains the planet, he explains the space elevator. We get the full, like, Ocean's Eleven schematics. hmm uh, we get who is going where, that they have to get a large chest of some sort, and they have to deliver it to uh, Ragoso's. what's he referred to him as, his ruler or his... his leader, I think. Leader, yeah. Maybe. So, and he get, uh, names his, this fella Atua Blank is his name. Yeah. So they're they're gonna end up in a sub tram, and they gotta protect this cargo that's in a chest. They're not allowed to look in the chest. They're not allowed to question the chest. They will they will get paid upon delivery of the chest, and then from there they take the elevators down. Yeah. Yep. And it's Lord Otua Blank. Okay. Uh, this species is Belugan. Um, I found the species interesting because uh, they have like this uh, a quarter split mouth, as it were. So they have mm-hmm. their their lips are in four parts. Right. So it, there are sections that both move up and down and right and left. Yeah. And then because of that, because there's like four lip quarters, they kind of flare out like a uh, <laughs> sort of, sort of like Audrey too from Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> or yeah. something like that. You know. Sure. Um, so it's like that weird hinge thing, which from a physiological standpoint, I don't, I do the, we're getting deep in the weeds here, but like, I don't understand how the sounds of galactic, galactic basic are being made with that mouth, but sure. Why not? Um, well, their teeth are regular. Like they have teeth like you and I do like human. Yeah. Humanoid teeth. Yeah. Like the same two semicircles worth of uh dentites shall we say right but i just still feel like with a split a vertical slit in the lip that would change the phonetics possible in human in 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 real world terms uh the, the english sounds possible i agree with you right so that was just my. They look cool. Like, yeah, it's fine. Like I have no actual personal problem with it. It was just one of those like interesting like, like I've been watching a lot of random science YouTube channels stuck at home, so <laughs> I'm seeing shit like this now. So yeah. Yep. I, I agree with you. But, but otherwise, they're they're cool. They're they're fun looking. Is this the first time we've seen the species, or I believe so, and I don't know that we see them again in the future. Yeah. Um, my comment would be that they are so they're supposed to be native to this planet, but they're also uh, classified as like an aquatic species. So yeah. I don't really understand that. Um, are they aquatic on a technicality of how thick the atmosphere is? So it's not described as like thick, it's described as being pressurized. So I'm I'm not really sure. Even more confused by that now. <laughs> yeah. Um we run down through this pressurized atmosphere. These elevators travel at 
super, super fast speeds, um, which whatever. Uh, I wonder if there's more than one of these little station things because they take like all six elevators between the seven of them. I was thinking that too. I thought it was weird that they didn't have like a lot, like a singular large platform, you know, because uh-huh. they're, uh, they're, you know, two meters, three meters wide, like maybe, right. you know, that's it. Uh, I and mean, two people can go on like one platform, right. uh, but I guess they're fast enough. That it's just it, weird because it'd be like if Sears Tower had six elevators and six elevators only, and they only like all went together, right? <laughs> like, right. It's it's just weird to me. Yeah, they all all of them descend at the same time, so they were all up at the same time. I mean, hopefully right. nobody was waiting at the bottom to get off or of this get back up place. Yeah. Uh, but there's also not like a whole, uh, a whole, I don't know, group of ships that are like docked up top. You know, it's just right. their ship. So it's not I don't know if there's just planet. not that much traffic moving in and out, right. or or what. I don't know that it matters to be honest. No, <laughs> no we're getting way deep in the weeds with that. So they hop on a train, right? That's what's they happening. They do hop on a train. Yeah, it's like one of those lev train things that's like going through hoops, like basically. Uh, this reminded me as like the the underground train tram thing and Black Panther. I was literally just gonna say that. That's literally. Uh, I was just gonna say in a future reference, it reminded me of Black Panther. Yeah, um, I I completely agree. Absolutely agree. That same like sort of it, it's like they're they're maglev hoops or something that the uh-huh. trains riding through so with like accelerators or something i'm not really sure something propulsors um, or yeah yeah so, so but pretty quickly once the train takes off some unknown raiders yep start attacking the train pretty much immediately yep uh, so these and- six are meant to uh, uh protect the cargo uh, so, so if, the the team was split up. So two are protecting the cargo itself. Two are kind of mid train, and then two are at the caboose. Well, there's only three cars. There's like the front car where the cargo um, is. Then there's an open <laughs> yeah. car in between, and then there's yeah. the rear car, the caboose. Yeah. Uh, there is a really cool, like long panning shot through the entirety of the train where it starts mm. at the cargo, and then Boba Fett's like. Oh, I sent the new girl and Dengar to the back. And then it like pans all the way through, like down the one hallway that there is, mm-hmm. right? It's just like a subway or a, a metro uh, yeah. train or whatever. All the way through. And then we end up uh, at the end with Simon Pegg and um, Ventress. Um, yes. And that was like super cool. Like the visuals in this episode are nice. Uh, I, I have some yeah. questions about these raiders whenever you want to talk about them. Sure. Um, so who's our, who's our one buddy, Ragoso? Ragoso mm-hmm. rides down the elevator with Boba, and Boba says, why hire six expensive bounty hunters to do this, to protect some cargo? And yeah. Ragoso is like, well, my guys... Uh, haven't been able to protect the cargo against these raiders than want the cargo back. Yeah. So has he tried to make this run before? I was curious about that too. In which and case does the cargo get captured and then they recapture the they cargo recapture and they like it. restart? I uh, That's how it was playing in my head. Exactly what you just said there. Because that phrasing also led me to have that exact same question as well. Um, or well, then the Raiders was... can't be that good if they can keep capturing this cargo. Like if Ragoso can keep capturing the cargo, but then the Raiders come back and like steal the cargo from him. Like they're not, it's just like a tightly matched like duel, I guess, you know, I guess I'm not really yeah, sure. But... Cause it... okay. So moving forward that the... these Raiders do put up a fight. And then my other question is like, there are a lot of these henchmen that keep coming up and attacking the train too. 
It's like, very video game esque. Like there's I, yes. an endless number of henchmen during the fight portion. Yeah. Of the uh, their of the tram spawn. game, and yeah, then once spawns. once they, you know, once all of our main characters get to the the secret chest of secretness. Yes. Then it's like uh boss battle mode, right? Basically, yeah. Where all of the henchmen are gone and we just have like the one guy remaining. Yeah, it's like it becomes one on one. So yeah, just running through that real quick. Yeah, like a lot of henchmen um a lot of fighting. There is some cool um choreography that happens during some of the fights. Absolutely. Uh, we get some cool weaponry that shows up. So C21 is really cool. We get that cool droid mode of shooting that we later see with uh, IG in uh, Mandalorian. So mm-hmm. that sort of cool thing. Yeah, it's um, like a, a horizontal windmill, windmill or yep. rotor style of just uh, rotating arms firing blissfully. Right. Uh, and it's effective. Like a water sprinkler of lasers, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Lats has sort of a modified um whip sword situation thing. Yeah, it looks like um like a scaly shaw, like um like the scales of a dragon, kind of organized in like some neckwear that she can throw out uh scorpion Mortal Kombat style. And right. do things so, to the people at the other end of it. Yeah, because it's it's definitely sort of like a um, modified version of a whip sword that you, I think the only other place I can remember it out. Shoot, now I'm going to mix it up. It's either in the video game Dead or Alive or Tekken. I want to okay. say Dead or Alive. But one of those characters has the whip sword thing, okay. which is a real weapon. Um, but hers, take your word for it. But hers are, as you said, like they're they're like attached to her as like sort of sleeve extensions. So it's like a scarf, mm-hmm. and rather than holding onto a hilt and then whipping the met- metallic sword bits around, she can like flip her arms so then in turn it's both an interesting um it takes influence from both the whip sword but also in chinese wuxia films fighting with sleeves Mm -hmm. is also sort of a thing that has happened in film before so fighting with sleeves fighting with hair has like sort of the same visuals Right. That has happened before if you've watched a lot of Chinese Wuxia films. Um, so this is taking like an interesting like in between mix blending of all of that together. So I I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I I wish it was utilized a little bit more because um, it there there are a few shots. So th- there's really good choreography in this uh-huh. episode that I feel get disrupted by the shot choices. Fair enough. So, you know, it's it's not bad. It just was distracting to me. Yeah. Fair enough. But, yeah, so then, <laughs> so then in order, I think, like, what, Dengar gets knocked off the train first, uh-huh. and then Bosk gets knocked off next, and then C-21 and Lats get knocked off together. Yeah, so when it happens to Bosk, it was interesting because one of these raiders, like, blows some dust in his face. And I was like, okay, he's going to be, like, drugged or something. Like, something is going to happen, but really he just gets dust blown in his face. Like, it's no Ah, magic powder or anything. And then then he just, like, gets... Yeah. Like, King of the Hill style. Uh, Dale Grill, pocket sand. Boom. There it goes. (laughs) And and that was it. And then he falls off. uh, And then... Lats actually takes herself and uh and the droid out. C twenty one, yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Yep. High so Singer. Then, 
Yeah, C21 High Singer. Yeah, so then that leaves Boba and Ventress fighting. Mm-hmm. Boba is left alone basically to protect the cargo while Ventress makes her way forward. He does and not then, do a great job. Not yeah. Um cuz then we get what you referred to as the 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 boss of boss the battle. henchmen. Yep. Yeah. So it's definitely a more skilled fighter. He definitely uh the the choreography here is pretty darn uh darn well done in terms of the, we get hand to hand combat that's going on which is a quite a rarity in this form so again this mm-hmm. is definitely a more martial arts inspired hand to hand combat scene rather than a down and dirty punch him out sort of fight right right so we get sort of more floaty kicks and uh spins and punches mm-hmm. that happen so I, I that's the choreography part that I, I think was really well done there. I think the Again, choreography in this episode in general was well done. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Um so then at some point the the cargo gets knocked over. And yeah, then it's like when, when Ventress comes back into this car and then I think they're Ventress and Boba are both fighting uh Boss Raider. And he, like, knocks Boba back or something who either hits the cargo or jumps off of the cargo and it falls over and the top just opens up. Yep. And then and we get a reveal of a lady inside. A little lady. There's a little lady. Uh, she does get a name. Yep. Pluma. Form. Yep. Pluma. And then we get a name on the raider boss as well. Crismo, Crismo. Yes. So it turns uh, out they apparently are this siblings. is brother and sister. Yep, they are and siblings. And the cargo the entire time was this little lady, uh, and so fighting stops, and Ventress comes up with her own plan, and Boba, she and Boba have a little talk or something because they have essentially subdued the other two, right? Real quick though, there is a moment I want to discuss. Sure. Um, when Boba discovers that it is a lady, the lady freaks out, and Boba interestingly has a moment where I think this is actually really well done in the animation, where you can kind of see him like the wheels are running, and then he he says, "I'll protect you," and then the Crismo, the brother, runs over and is like, "What are you talking about?" And then Pluma slaps. Boba, Boba on the face, and then Boba gets taken aback. He's like, wait, w- what's going on here? And then Ventress is like, hey, you idiot, can't you see that she's with them? Right, exactly. <laughs> so I, I did like that moment. Because I it humanizes Boba in a very interesting way. Uh-huh. Right. Where he he does he he was gonna do the job and he would have done it respectfully being a bounty hunter and all but then the fact that, that he discovers what the package is it's like uh we get that uh do you remember the movie the transporter <laughs> you know mm, yes with, and no yeah uh, we get that moment where you know he never looks at the package and then one day he discovers that he's uh transporting a lady <laughs> so <laughs> um so we we get that fun little moment um yeah, but then, like, immediately after, Bo was like, well, this is our job. We're going to deliver her to whomever, right? Right. He still wants his money. And yeah. uh, it's at this point that Ventress informs Boba that her cut is now half uh, because there's only two of them left. Uh, right. Boba doesn't like this, and, and she, he, again, belittles him and says nobody in their right mind is going to pay out their bounty to a little boy and uh he's pissed uh there was a little interaction between pluma and ventress where pluma says um you'll never know what it feels like to be forcibly taken from your people and ventress is kind of looking past the camera with an agonized look on her face and says Mm -hmm. something to the effect of I do know and I wish I didn't or something like yeah. that. So then she talks to Boba and then uh, at that point we kind of cut to the end of the tram ride and mm-hmm. Ventress is 
pushing the cargo out to uh, Lord Blank, mm-hmm. which is such a weird name. Um, to a blank, yeah. And yeah, so she that. collects her money. Uh, somebody tries to open it, and she's like, ah, 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 uh, money first. Uh, so they give her this big, fat suitcase full of unmarked credits. Mm-hmm. thought it was interesting. They definitely called them unmarked. I don't know. Like, her credits, they have, like, serial numbers or... Um, Probably something like that. I don't know. Credits are one of those weird things where it feels like some type of electronic payment, but it's actually... Just like an old school metal based, yeah. Uh, it's it's something. an actual. Th- it's not. It's not even a. <laughs> despite being called credits, um, they're not credits. They're physical yeah. tender. The, the physical object, yeah. The precious the, the metal tender. Itself, yeah, the object itself is what holds value. It's not a. Um, it's not an actual credit or debit. Yeah, from an account. What's it called on the dollar bill where it's a uh, gold standard? I have not even uh, uh, no. So it's, it's not even called because like you can find if if you can find the old. Um, I had one for a long time where it was like a silver silver standard dollar. Yeah, yeah. But then, what what does the current money say now? Because it doesn't say that. It doesn't say silver standard. It says like federal federal Garen. reserve note. Yeah, reserve. It's a reserve note. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you're putting the faith in the government to give that value. Right. Yep. So, yeah. So, I, I always found that interesting. Um, Yeah, yep. Yeah, you're right. I'm just looking up real quick. So, reserve note. Yeah. So, it's not a silver note. It's it's not backed by anything. It's just backed by Yeah, it's no longer backed by gold. That yeah, isn't... Backed that was, like, the, the, the 80s, right? That was with no, I, Reagan. I think even... No, I want to I say thought, Nixon did that. Oh, that could be. Yeah, uh, regardless, to, <laughs> um, so that's your your monetary uh, fiduciary history, everybody. <laughs> right. Uh, so that you can continue looking that up to get a solid date and inform no, the peoples. Nope. We're moving forward. But uh, uh, take us out. Take us out, man. Ventress gets her suitcase full of actual physical credits, and um, Lord Blank says, "Where is my bride?" And it's yeah. at this point that this episode got like extra gross because oh, yeah. we the, like this is just child sex it's, trafficking is what oh, is happening completely. here. Absolutely. Yep. Um but very explicit. Yeah. Lucky for Pluma, uh Ventress did not put Pluma back in the trunk. She tied up Boba Fett and put him in there. Yep. So Atua gets a surprise. Turns out uh, we later see Ventress walking behind Pluma with mm-hmm. Chrismo a little bit ahead, but it looks like Asajj still has them hostage. But she Asajj... turns them back over to their people, but she also yep. charges like a smaller bounty. Gets more money. Yeah. Gets some so more she's making money. a double bounty there. Yeah, so she's making double money, which is cool. But then she does regroup with the other bounty hunters back at the ship. They're all fine. They just all went back to the ship. They just took she the de- elevators up. Yep. She delivers the bounty in full uh, after taking her own share out of there. Yep. So, so she, she only, took only took her one-sixth cut. Yep. And says Boba's cut is in there also. Make sure he gets it. And somebody's like, oh, where is he? And she's like, eh, he'll turn up. Yep. And then uh, this is pretty much the end of it, except for Lat says, "Oh, you're really, you're really part of the team." And she's like, "No, no, I'm not. I used to be like you, but now I'm not. I like there's like something else out." She's like, "There's something else out there for me. My destiny is somewhere else." And then yeah, she, music. yeah. she said, uh, "I'm part of no team. Once I was just like you. Now I have a future." Uh, what is she? What's she talking about there? Like she was Team Dooku. No, I have no team idea. Sith? Honest, nah, uh, team Sith. Nah. Team. It was witches, again, and then she got them all killed. I don't know, man. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie. Like the dialogue in this whole episode gets clunky here and there, and this this is a very clunky line to end on. I it's. 
I like the visuals where we end because she's like walking away from this group and they're kind of lined up and uh, she essentially walks to the window staring out to the stars uh, and yeah. we kind of pan in to just uh, singularize her in the frame and then, you know, she says whatever she says. I was saying cue loud music. That's the end of it. Again, again, visually is fine. I agree. Visually it's fine. It's just that last line is just a little clunky where I'm just like, all right, bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> so I was like, all right. Uh, I mean, sure. <laughs> I don't so know I, what you mean, I, lady. Like, I think we're both in agreement that this is uh, visually. This is nice. Yes. As far as the choreography goes, it's nice. Mm. Um, dialogue could have been touched up a little bit, maybe. Um, so, like you know, it's it's like Star Wars. It's you know, it's a, it's like Star Wars that we grew up with. <laughs> okay. Well, so that being said, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm gonna say this first. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I had trouble caring about this episode okay because this I, uh, with what happened last week uh-huh i'm gonna admit that this was a really weird sidestep okay that said this episode is still good and i'm gonna give it a thumbs up you know it's still a fun entertaining episode it's not such a sidestep as in the box right i agree with you there um, right I'm going to so, give like, this a thumbs up as well. And mm-hmm. I think that overall, I would say this, this one is fine. Um, yeah. This one does kind of have the thing that we talked about last week where like the action piece of it is kind of the least interesting thing, even mm-hmm. though visually it's like the most interesting thing. Right. But I do agree with you that it's, you can just kind of let this one wash over you from beginning to end. And you're like, okay, Asajj is is going somewhere. Like she's trying to find her place mm-hmm. in the universe, and right. she did this thing. Um, the first time that I watched this, I was only like half paying attention, and then like when she collected that second bounty for from uh, the Raiders, which I question like where their origin is because they're not like an aquatic people and they got glowy eyes and that are like glowy eyed ninja people. Right. Um, like did she, was that an actual bounty or was she just like, Hey, I'll let you guys go. If you give me some money, you know what I'm saying? Like, was that, I think it's like that. Yeah. It's definitely, no, it's like that. Right. Okay. It's the second. It's not like these people like hired a bounty hunter to try to save, uh, no, 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 no. It's Christmas just like sister. A, okay. No, it's it's a ransom. It's a ransom, not a bounty. Okay. Right. Perfect. So, I'm good with that. Yeah. That's what I got out of the second deal there. It's 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 a yeah, it's a it's a ransom offer. It's like, "Yo, I got something you want. You know, pay for it or no?" What do you feel about like the message of uh of this episode? Like is there a message? <sighs> See, I you're 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 you alluded to it or you mentioned it where this is supposed to be kind of giving Asajj a singular adventure Mm -hmm. on her own it's just the way the show sort of operates that this is why it feels clunky to me and you know it's it's not fault of the writers or anything it's just the fact that we go from um Night Sisters getting decimated to this solo side adventure mm-hmm. uh, where I th- she needs to go through this thing to feel like she needs to find her destiny somewhere else, right? So, and I, I totally, that's... I totally get that. Mm-hmm. And, but then why at the end is it like this weird child sex life thing? I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I I, think I don't understand a, why that needs to also be included in this. Like, ooh, that's bad, but uh, we'll just that's throw a Boba Mag- Fett in here. No, it's a, it's. A, think of it as a MacGuffin that they tried to add details to. Okay. Right. That's where. That's how I see that. Okay. Did we need that details? Perhaps not. You know, but okay. is it's there, right? R- regardless, I still see Pluma as a MacGuffin. You know. Mm-hmm. 
it's it's just a named MacGuffin this time. Okay. Or, or, or MacGuffins are usually named, and sometimes they aren't. But you know, um, but yeah, it, it, she's a MacGuffin. You know? okay. <laughs> Simple as that. Like it could be her. It could be a Maltese Falcon. You know, <laughs> like right. it, it could be a box full of money. Right. So. This, it's just that in the Suitcase way the sh- light, yeah. It, it's just in the way that the show is structured that when they do an arc, or okay, no, no, no. Maybe let, let's put it this other way because because of the order we watch it in, it does change the intention sometimes. Okay, or the intention is less clear. But in this string of episodes, these are actually in release order, right? Correct. So they are sticking with Asajj. So from the last one to this, they are sticking with her. Correct. And I'm feeling like the next one's still going to deal with Asajj in some form. But okay. because they still want kind of that middle story somewhere, whereas other shows that aren't nearly as episodic as Clone Wars, you know, mm-hmm. it would kind of spread this out over two or three episodes. Mm-hmm. But because of the way Clone Wars works, where for the most part, there's even in the arcs, they're still trying to wrap up things right at the end of an episode, right? Right. Like, there aren't really too many arcs that keep rising up through multiple episodes. Okay. One big arc is only made up of little arcs, and the big arc is only because they're a shared character or a shared topic or a shared event. Does that make sense? Yep, it totally does. So that's why with this episode, the fact that you and I are kind of having this issue of like, okay, like what's the point sort of of this episode or what's the theme or the life lesson we're supposed to take away from this? It's it's just sort of because of that way that this show is structured and that this arc is, con- it, it's the event is following the previous episode, but it's not, the arc isn't, continuing from the last episode yeah and is um, that a fine differentiation yes it is and i will say that is one thing that i like about this episode like uh because it was it was you know it was kind of weird jumping like back to ahsoka after doing that weird obi-wan thing with the box and everything mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it'd been a while since i i said ahsoka not ahsoka ventress right uh right. it had been a while since we had seen ventress uh, mm-hmm. so in that case, uh, the newsreel definitely helped me remember what had been going on, but then Ventress, it felt was kind of defeated there. And Talzin is like, Hey, you have a future. It's just not with the sisters of Dathomir, right? Yeah. You're going to have to forge your own path. And then here we see, not necessarily that happening, but like the beginning of Asajj is at least not following some other person that is telling her what to do. Yeah, she's and getting then, agency. Yeah. You know, she does a thing and she gets mm. through to the end and she learns a little bit about herself. Uh, and that's that. And I'm cool yeah. with it. You I know? think the other thing with this episode that's interesting, and I brought this up last week too, and it's the exact same thing and that follows through here, is that I don't know how we're supposed to feel about Asajj because she's always been a villain before, but in these last two episodes, she's been the protagonist of the arcs, of the stories. You know? Yep, fair enough, man. But there's still that, that flip that sort of happens where you know, she's about to sell somebody into sex slavery, but then she doesn't. So then is she good? Is she bad? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about her. Hmm. Like, yeah, she's, I don't know she's that a good and the bad are terms that are appropriate to apply to her any longer. Right. Or at least in this stage of her, um, character, her personal growth. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You got anything else for for this one? No, nope, nope. Let's close it out. We got a we got a double thumbs up here. Um, next week we have an episode titled "Brothers," 
which is interesting. Lorenzo, yeah. you said that uh, you thought that that Asajj Ventress was going to carry carry on in here. So you got you got any predictions on on brothers? Okay. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real honest, and we've talked about. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the negative before I say the positive. Okay. So we we've reviewed many episodes mm-hmm. out of ninety. Mm-hmm. Shit. Yeah, we ninety. Would, we, yep, we would have reviewed ninety of them. Or sorry, yes. Or, or uh, let me complete that thought <laughs> instead of pausing. Uh, I, I just had a mild stroke. Don't worry about that. I'll, Don't mind me. I'll um, check on you more after we're done. <laughs> so, my, yeah, my the blue screen of death just popped up in my brain here. Um, so. <laughs> I think I've mentioned a lot through 90 episodes that I have watched every episode at least once prior to us sitting down and doing uh-huh. these re- this rewatch. Yep. And by and large, I do not remember a lot of these episodes. I'm right. not going to lie. I don't remember this episode. Did not remember Boba Fett and Asajj meeting in this fashion at all. Yep. That said, with an episode called Brothers coming after a two Asajj Ventress arc and one of them dealing with Mother Talzin, I have a pretty clear idea of where we're going in the next episode. Like, if I'm wrong on where we are in the next episode and, you know, it's going to be the return of a character, um, I will, again, blame it on a stroke, but... uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're shifting gears and we're going to go with Pluma's brother, Chris Mo, and whoever his <laughs> brother is. Those are going to be our two brothers next week. So there's the I trio. I think this was just it's like, like a transitionary episode to meeting, <laughs> to meeting that family, and we're going to learn oh uh, about those brothers. That's, that's oh what I got. Boy. These, this weird ninja clan, this like not ninja clan ninja clan. They are apparently cage fighters or cage warriors, rather K A G E, and uh, that is their species. The cage, uh, they are the second sentient species on this pressurized planet where people live really? underground and ride giant centipedes, and some of is them it... are aquatic, even though they have no water. Okay, no, 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 no. If it's K A G E and they're ninjas, then because then then that's going to be Kage. If if we're going full Japanese, okay, that's that's where uh, my nerdiness of watching so many Absolutely, samurai films. Man. That's uh, I am happy to be corrected. Yeah, like the, the, the Kage. Wouldn't the there Kage be an group. accent in there somewhere? No, no, it's um, it's it's uh, it's how the Japanese uh, alphabet or the. Uh, I don't alpha, yeah it's alphabet but also cuz of the way the Japanese um hiragana and katakana works is that mm-hmm. each character actually equates to a sound yeah, that is possible like phonetic, within Japanese right? not yeah so not ka is ka is one part and then ge is a second part so um usually when romanizing Japanese mm-hmm. characters into Arabic English readable letters um right. accents do not generally get applied to uh japanese text the same way that actually now i'm thinking about it, uh, uh not vietnamese vietnamese definitely has accents um but does chinese like when chinese gets romanized i don't believe we add any accents to those either for the most part so Couldn't yeah we uh, in in the uh more widely used romanization of japanese for sure, I I don't believe um, any sort of accent marks are applied, and it's just um, because also Japanese uh, alphabet follows some pretty hard rules. Uh, so like ka k a will always be pronounced ka, mm-hmm. uh, g e will always be gay, and it's always a hard g. Otherwise, other things are romanized j i. For, right. or J E for the the soft that soft sound right mm-hmm. so um yeah so kage is uh how that'd be pronounced because i took one semester of japanese and i know that much i could not say jack shit of anything else but uh i i really liked japanese because there's there's generally always like a pattern of consonant vowel consonant vowel sounds right uh-huh. 
Yeah, so. I took non-Western art history, and my teacher was um, was born in Japan and emigrated here with her shit with her family. Uh, nice. So, yes, I learned. I I did learn some pronunciation as well. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, moving on from that. So the kage. Um, yeah. That's what I'm Do saying. Do we ever That's, see these people are ever the, again? Yeah, I'm those, looking. I'm looking at Pluma. This is her first and only appearance. Uh, she nope, gets that's mentioned. wrong because we're gonna we're gonna see those brothers next week. <laughs> and oh, if boy. I'm wrong, you can head on over to nothingers.com. Tell me about that. Um, hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or other. And yeah. if you leave us want, those YouTube comments. Yeah, YouTube comments for sure. There's a couple of behind the scenes people as well. That would be Kevin over on Twitter at they call me K Dub. He is our graphic artist. Uh, Lindsay through Gmail at strange fantasy music at gmail.com. She put together our intro outro music and um, a friend of mine named Anthony at Blue the Beard on Twitter who was kind enough to put together our website. So yeah, uh, yeah. It's because of them that uh, we're here. Or in addition to us, they helped us out. However, that works. Uh, yeah. But until next week, when we see the Kage brothers again, <laughs> I've been no, Kevin. No more Kages. I've been Lorenzo. These aren't the nerds you're looking for. Bye bye, everybody. Bye-bye.